this is, this is, this is. Great to see you, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Great to see you. I'm really excited. Um, oh, dude, I've been checking out the new the new songs. I'm getting pumped. Thanks, man. I'm I'm super excited. You know, um, it's it's amazing that you know I'm getting close to sixty now and still getting excited by a new album. That's a great feeling. You know, that is a great feeling. You're not just chasing something you can't get to. You're actually there, which is right, kind right. of amazing. Well, I, I've, I've just, I know that there are some folks, and you guys are still creating and everything, I know that, and, and so you get, there are some, though, who I think are doing like, you know, like, um, oh, I don't know, I'm just making this up, but some of the superstars, like, I don't know, Willie Nelson, I think, or somebody, you know, they, they'll do a, a show, and it's largely their hits, and, and or maybe all their hits. It's more like a retro, which is fine, right? Because the, the fans want that, you know? Yeah. They want to hear For All the Girls I've Loved Before, and they want to hear, you know, all those kinds of songs. And that's great, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. But for me, I, I want to always be creating, man. I just, I just it's in my DNA um, to, to create and, to, and, and hopefully to create stuff that's, like, even better than stuff you did in the past. Like, I don't want to just create for the sake of it. I want to do, and I really think this new... Don't sleep album is really, you know, it's shocking how good I thought it was when I heard it all put together and everything. I, mm-hmm. I knew, of course, the songs, but when I heard them sync it all up and put it together and sequence it and all that stuff, I was like, wow, you know, it was cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I kind of just have been jumping in both feet, listening to the two songs, kind of getting back into your catalog. I was, I was reminded of all my favorites from, you know, from all your bands, but then I was just like. You know, just because it's so much easier nowadays to like look through the catalog of a band, whereas before you had to like own the record or oh, maybe even yeah. a, a zine or something. But even then, it wasn't necessarily all there. So like going back, looking at you know Dag Nasty, all uh, you know Down by Law has so many more records than I even realized at the time because I think I, I only yeah. heard two of them back. You know. Yeah. Well, I hope you can check out the album Lonely Town, which is our last one. I really love that album. I uh, did actually, and I, and I really okay, liked cool, it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's an adult punk record, I would say, maybe. You know. Um, well, you know, nothing sounds like when I go back and listen to De- you know, Can I Say or something like that. You know, sure. and then I listen to the new stuff. It obviously sounds a little different recording wise, but to me, the spirit, the energy is all there right now, and and it's like. Wow, so so this is what it's like to succeed at something because, like I said, just going back through your catalog, discover you know rediscovering my favorite songs from your bands and then listening to ones that I had forgotten about things like that. It's it's pretty cool, pretty cool. And then here we are, don't sleep. You guys are killing it. I love the two new the new songs that you guys have out. Um, the new record comes out really actually. This is coming out Monday, so it'll be out this Friday, June second is that about right okay. yeah so june 2nd yeah i think that's right yeah that's awesome well i'm so glad you're digging those songs man that makes me really actually really happy um yeah, yeah. I, i'm with you I'm, I'm i'm digging them too you know i heard one of them on the radio the other day and i was uh, the promise made you know and i was like well, this sounds really good you know i was like dang you know it's really cool um i was really happy to hear it yeah yeah i mean what was the mission going into the new album so it's a great question you know I, I so i'm not sure if you were aware or how much you know background you know they gave you on this but we recorded uh like 19 songs or 20 songs when we recorded uh right before COVID hit and the first album was gonna come out called turn the tide mm-hmm. and and that album i really love as well um one of my favorite songs that i ever wrote is on that album it's a it's a sort of a dark reggae uh, punk mm. reggae song um, called um, uh, The Wreckage. Bass tones and, are great uh, on that, by the way. Oh, thanks. That's thanks. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Garrett and, and, and the engineer. And, you know, also, um, uh, uh, the, the, we had a lot of help on that record. So we had, we had the, two, the two main producers, um, um, Carson and Grant, who were the main guys. But then um, we also had uh, a couple other big names that helped us uh, on the engineering and producing side. And um, so, uh, so anyway, we had a lot of help to make that thing come out great. And um, and I always say, like everything in life, you know, you're you're only, 
you know, it's always when you see an artist, you always you, you love your artist, hopefully. But there's a lot of people that made that artist who they are, mm-hmm. you know, and um, never you don't operate in a vacuum or whatever, you know, um, line you want to use. It takes a village or, you know, whatever. I, I don't know whatever, you know, line you want to use. But it does take a lot of people to make art besides just the artist, you know, and as evidenced by that, you look at a guy like Vincent van Gogh who sold, I believe in his life, Vincent van Gogh, arguably the, you know, one of the most powerful, great painters of all time. I think he sold one painting in his life. One Vincent van Gogh. Imagine that crazy. Yeah. Because why? Because he didn't have the machinery around him Mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to, to make him succeed. Um, whereas, let's say another great artist is Keith Haring, right? Mm -hmm. Keith Haring in our, in our era. And Keith Haring is a fabulous artist, obviously nothing in style, like, you know, in some totally different style, but more modern art and everything. But, but Keith Haring, you can get posters, t-shirts, mugs, you know, whatever, you know, and he's got major displays in every museum and, and well-deserved. Um, but, but, you know, just the difference in the surrounding, um, team that you have with you is, is, is remarkable, I think. And so, so, um, don't sleep has had a very, uh, fortunate, uh, group of people helping us. But anyway, that's a long story. I apologize. No, nope. after all good. After, when we recorded all those songs, we knew at that time we did it on purpose. We knew there was going to be a first album and a second album. The reason we did that is all the songs we really loved and we didn't want to, um, to just you know we we knew exactly which one i mean it was it was really an interesting thing like the the first album the flow was key and mm-hmm. i think that you know you know this better than most like the, the 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 successful album is based on the flow right and um the sequencing mm-hmm. um but really that's a karmic thing to me it's like an energy does the energy flow right and getting that right order of songs and picking in this case out of 20 down to to 12 was was the you know um, Garrett uh, our bass player and um, when Tony our our um, uh, rhythm guitar player and sort of like ringleader of of chaos you know um, they they really sequenced it and um, mm. and you know ran it by everybody of course but they did a lot of good hard work on that and um, and we knew which ones we wanted for the second record and the really cool thing I think about doing it this way which I've never done before so I've never had a um, when we recorded so many songs and we knew there was going to be a first record, we knew there was going to be a second record. The cool thing about doing it this way, which I'm discovering is, you know how you hear about that thing, the sophomore slump for yeah. a lot of bands? Yeah. And the second record is just like a letdown, especially if the first one's a really on fire record. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really hard. Like even great groups, you know, suffer like the second record for the clash, which is actually one of my favorite records, you know, give them enough rope mm-hmm. like that. But that was regarded as a as a like a failure or whatever, you know, after because the first Clash album is is, you know, untouchable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So 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 like, you know, but there are people who didn't like, um, you know, who didn't like the second. I mean, can you imagine that? But um, yeah. Right. (laughs) So there's this whole sophomore slump and it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a bit of a a fair assessment sometimes, you know, and bands, they go. They have their whole beginning of their career, which might be years before they record their first album, mm-hmm. right? And those songs, they they worked them hard in the studio and, and rehearsals and redone lyrics, redone guitar parts, redone bass lines, everything. They've got those songs down. Well, then you put one out, and I don't know if you guys experienced this as well, but you put your first record out and, you know, it's like, boom, it hits. Well, now you got to do a second, but you don't have it forever anymore. You're like expected to do it 12 months, 15 months. You know, that thing should be out. Yeah. Your second record. So it's a it's a challenge. And you got a taste of success. So you start you think you start second guessing yourself. You're thinking less about a little bit, I think, uh, you know, less about the, the art as and more about there's pressure of time. You know, OK, everybody seemed to like this song. Should we write another one like this? You know, yeah. or things like that. It starts to get other other karma involved there's, so, there's cook, know, more like cooks it. into the kitchen so to speak even in your mind right yeah like you're thinking yeah, about like a good way of putting it more cooks in the kitchen yeah and, and, it, and it's not necessarily just like some like record label guy because it could be like your own pressure right as a songwriter as a band getting together be like oh man they, they really liked that we better give them something even better 
And that mentality is like, it breaks you in a way, and, and we, which explains the sophomore, sophomore slump. But I mean, it happens to bands all the time. I know exactly what you mean. And uh, I love your idea of record a bunch, record your first two first albums, right? Like, <laughs> so if you love the first record, you will love this record because yeah. the sounds and the, the energy and the karma and the flow and the spark, the fire, everything is there. In fact, I would argue, I don't know, this is going to get me in trouble, but this record to me hit me really, really great when I heard it all put together, this new record, um, Sea Change. The other one I loved, but there were like six songs that I really loved, and there were six songs I liked a lot, and you know what I mean? But this yeah. one, I listened to it when they sent it to me all sequenced out and everything, and and um, I was like, dang, and I listened to it again like three times. Yeah. You know? And that's a good sign. That's a great sign. I mean, to, yeah. to, to let's talk more about sequencing, because when I heard, um, you know, I was listening to Turn the Tide, and I heard December, and I wasn't looking at anything. I was like doing, I'm upstairs doing some lighting fixing some lighting stuff upstairs and and i heard december come on and i'm like this must be the last song because it was just like this is like a all right thanks for coming this is sort of how we want to leave you and it leaves you almost like because then it starts again and then you're ready to go you're like all right let's go again so like i love records that have a, a cool ending song that that kind of gets you prepared for another round well that's a really cool way of putting it thanks and i'm glad you mentioned that song because that one this was really interesting. Um, I wrote that, and it's a very melancholy song, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's kind of like looking back and remembering how great, you know, a certain time was and, and painful memories, too. And so, uh, but I remember I wrote that super late at night, like, I want to say one in the morning, I finished it. And, and I wrote it all in pretty much one, you know, long, I'd been writing it for four or five hours, you know. And I texted Tom, uh, our lead guitar player, and I, I texted him because I knew he he worked at a um, he, he worked at a bar and as a bartender and he was getting out, um, you know, pretty late. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's a late night job by definition, you know. So so I texted him and said, hey, you, you know, are you awake? And he was. And I I played it for him like over the phone, you know, on the speaker. Mm -hmm. and I hadn't recorded it or anything yet. And I just played it for him. And he's like, I love that. We're doing it. We're recording it. Send it to me, you know, and, and he loved it right away. So that was the first time I'd ever had something like that where I just called somebody in the middle of the night and and like there was this connection and, and we talked about it over the phone. And it was just a really cool, you know, um, energy vibe that we had there. So I, I really remember doing that just by myself downstairs in the, my daughter's playroom, um, which was, you know, kind of where I played my guitar stuff usually. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, yeah. you can't bash people. I mean, you bash people over the head for a while and then they have to be ready to hear something completely different, completely new. So like December is obviously like more of a, a chiller song. Like you said, like it's melancholy. It's, it's not like we're getting to go, ah, you know, but you can't put a song like that second on a record or first on a record, unless the, all your right. songs kind of sound like that, then it's okay. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it really does matter where you put things. And then of course you hear like, the modern takes on it well now you know people get the album but then they don't necessarily listen to the album in order they're listening to this and this and random songs and that's okay too if you're just hearing a random song and you hear december yeah. you're gonna be like this is a cool song all right cool but yeah, yeah i agree in the flow yeah. it matters where it is i think in the flow and i'm still an old school guy and i argue, i would argue that the a great record or album you know um is is something you know it's like writing a it's like reading a book, right? You don't, in my mind, if I'm going to read, um, you know, pick your book, you know, let's just say it's a, I don't know, Agatha Christie novel or a mystery, mystery novel, right? Agatha Christie, right? So, which I sometimes read when I just need some good escapism, you know, just read a detective novel by Agatha Christie, you know? So, mm -hmm. but you can't just read like the third chapter, <laughs> right? read the whole thing, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, it's probably a good chapter on its own, but you don't get any of the context or the storyline or the, you know, whereas an album has that sort of same flow as a book um, if it's done well. And, you know, there is a cover to the album, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's a lyric sheet, hopefully, or something insert of some sort, maybe. And, um, yeah, so I feel like that's, uh, that's a pretty fair analogy that, you know, yes, you can definitely do that. And sometimes, you know, like there's this band. I don't know if you remember the band Jesus Jones. Oh yeah, uh, they wrote the right wrote here, right now. Great song called "Right Here, yeah, Right Here, Right Now." It's it is like perhaps the perfect pop song, right? It is, and it has you know 
poignancy to the lyrics. It's about watching the fall of the Berlin Wall and, you know, all that stuff. It's mm-hmm. it's a great song. Uh, and, and I probably am going to get heat for this from some huge Jesus Joan fan, and I'm not trying to be negative. In fact, I'd like to be, be you know, corrected. Um, I went through just real quick onto, you know, uh, whatever it was, into Google Music or whatever it was that I was looking for the, for the, um, uh, you know, for some other songs by them. And I didn't give it, you know, tons of time. So this is a fair qualification that I didn't give it enough time probably. But I, I just was like, I listened to like three or four songs. I'm like, dang it, none of them are that great, like, are as great as that one, you know? And I was looking for another one that was in the same vein, kind of like what you were saying about, you know, December or whatever, you know? And I couldn't find that. And I was like, oh, well, you know, and I, I just thought it would, I attributed it to being a one hit wonder. Um, maybe they aren't. Maybe I'm missing out. And I'd like to find out if I am. But uh, but that was kind of like an example where I I didn't get the whole album. I just listened to the one song and it was great. And I'm content with that. It's actually on my playlist on my, you know, on my YouTube music playlist, you know, but um, yeah, you know. Honestly, like, I feel like a lot of people listen to this podcast just to be reminded of things they used to listen to and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to check that out. So a bunch of people are going to be, like, adding that to their playlist this week. But but it is a song, like, those are songs that we kind of just grew up and they hit us and we didn't necessarily know a lot about the bands that we were hearing back in those days, right? Because there wasn't a page you could just go to or, you know, you had to have a hard magazine or, or whatever it is, but... um those are classic songs. Now I'm just trying to think, if, have I ever heard another Jesus Jones song? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I think there's another song called Real, Real, Real. Could you be real, real, real? Or something like that. And and I think I did possibly download that one too. But it was it was a it was not in the same uh, stratospheric level of, of, of their big hit. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another strange band is Toad the Wet Sprocket. Do you remember them? I do remember them. I don't know their music very well. I just kind of knew of them. I was, but at that point, you know, that was like yeah. what, the 90s, right? And I was like fully into the punk world and wasn't listening to much else, probably. But anyway, yeah, I do know who they are. They're just another classic example of like a, a, a well, kind of the opposite. Like they weren't nice, necessarily a huge band, but they had a huge radio hit. But all their songs sounded exactly like those songs. Like they all had oh, that okay. vibe to them. So okay. um, yeah, gotcha. pretty cool. Anyway, I know people want to hear about punk rock, hardcore, and all that. You know, I, I grew up listening yeah. to to punk rock and hardcore, you know, and that's why I'm still here. But, you know, I came to to Dag Nasty and, and what you were doing through all. Like I, I got into all and descendants, um, you know, Bremerton, I'm from Bremerton, Washington, and it's sort of like a hotbed oh, yeah. I remember for all. great shows in Bremerton for all. Yeah. yeah. So you played, yeah. say, I never saw you live. I, I, I kind of like. We played at least once or twice in Bremerton, and they were good shows. Yeah, no, no. But even in my, my one year plus in the band, I, I definitely am pretty sure I'd put a steak dinner on it that we that we uh we played in bremerton yeah i remember hearing about all coming and and but the thing is is i found out about you guys in ninth grade ninth grade yeah yeah ninth grade and um and you were already out of the band by then it was like it was like their percolator percolator tour that they were on um but but man like Hearing those records, like I going back and listening to you know for, for, to talk to you, listening to those records, um, says all the way for Prez, that kind of stuff. Like I can just hear myself in all of it. Like you, I, I had no idea that I was influenced as much as I I was by you. Like Thank really. You, Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was awesome. So how did you how did you go from hardcore to singing in this like pop like I, I guess you, you don't necessarily think about it, right? Like so so what sticks out to you d- during those times? That's a great question. I think for me my career has been um marked by attempts to do things um to be off to, to not follow a script. And um you know, in DYS in the eight, early 80s, um, you know, we were a, a definitely hard, straight edge, proud, straight edge band, you know, hardcore. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I wouldn't trade a, a day of it, not a second of it. You know, um, we were all of us in the Boston crew at that time were kind of uh, doing stuff that 
we didn't really know, or at least I'll speak for myself. I didn't really know what we were doing. I didn't realize that we were creating this whole thing. Like, yes, yeah, Straight Edge, the song was from was from Minor Threat, obviously, and great pivotal song. And you know, I think there was like sort of like Ian, you know, in DC, and and then Kevin Seconds on the on the West Coast, you know, and then Boston. And most of the Boston bands from the Boston crew were Straight Edge, or at least a lot of us. Certainly, SSD Control and DYS. Mm-hmm. We're, we're known for being, you know, very, you know, straight edge bands. And, and, and we made two records. But even there, if you look at DYS's story, what a jump from Brotherhood into the second album, which was like a more rock record. We've been all listening to Metallica. And this, the reason I'm telling you this story is because it relates to your question mm-hmm. about how did I end up in awe. So what we found out as we, as we, grew as a band in dys and this is so the first album came out 82 83 something like that and then um and then uh we we all loved like you know when we were working out and we were all like these most of us were pretty hardcore about working out like weights and everything so when we were lifting weights it was always like metallica priest maiden um bad brains black flag um you know um misfits um, there were some others, but but a lot of metal, ACDC, um, you know, a lot of metal and hard rock. Motorhead, of course, as soon as they were out, Motorhead was like one of my favorite bands, almost from the from the get go. But um, so so that stuff was in our DNA. Well, all of a sudden, the guitar players in the band, who were already you know pretty pretty talented guys, um, they started you know realizing, hey, I could do a little lead in there, you know, like mm-hmm. and there's there's a 20 second break in there. Why don't I throw in a lead? Like we'd never done that before, really, for the first in the first days of the band. And then you know Jonathan, our bass player, Jonathan Anastas, um, who was the co-founder of DYS with with me, and um, you know he was trying some different things, and we were trying different things, songwriting, and then those influences were were starting to. I don't know, we were sort of smashing through our own self-imposed barriers, right? Like we were like, you know, first of all, if you're a hardcore musician or if you're a musician of any sort, if you have barriers, you got to knock those things down, man. Because, and it's in life, I would say, if you have barriers that are self-imposed, freaking knock them down, you know, because life is way too short to have self-imposed barriers. Um, You know, and that's why I actually really respect some of the bands that have tried to go different thing, do different things and mm-hmm. tried different sounds. And, you know, sometimes it fails. Sometimes you fall on your face. And But the nature of what punk teaches us is to get up and get back on the horse, right? And um, and you have colleagues around the equivalent. This is an analogy to life, right? In the, in the pit of life, you know, the, the slam dance pit of life, people will reach down and pick you up in the punk scene. Yeah. And um, they do that in the clubs. If you get knocked down in the pit, somebody, you know, picks you up hopefully and helps you up and then the same thing in real life if you're an artist and you struggle and you know your friends and your fans come back and let you try again you know um so not all change is good and you shouldn't throw out the whole you know everything you love just to try something new but if you can expand and do something different heck just do it man just do it and so so we we did that and that second dys record was like boom all right so then i moved back to dc you know which is where i I came up northern virginia and and brian plays me these songs from the demo for dag nasty and uh, just a four song demo that they'd done and he's like what do you think and i said i love that music more than anything i've ever heard practically and 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 so we you know he's like well good we need a roadie and i'm like okay cool (laughs) i was a roadie I was yeah. a roadie for the first, you know, few, I don't know, few months, six months, whatever. And I'd been a roadie helping out when I could with SSD or the FUs or whoever in, you know, in Boston. I wasn't much of a roadie, um, but I could lift things if I had to. And So were you still, sorry to interrupt, were you still technically yeah. in in SYD? No, uh, in DYS. DYS, sorry. D- sorry yeah, DYS. no worries, no worries. DYS uh, broke up in 85, and then I moved back to, I should have said that. We broke up in 85, and um, it was just time. We'd, we'd run our course, and we kind of had done the two albums that we were meant to do. And so and, uh, in that, did you do any songwriting, like lyrics and stuff like that? But, in Dagnasty? Or no, in, in DYS. Yeah, we we mostly uh, that was that was a band band a band's band. It wasn't like one or two people wrote it all. Mm-hmm. We actually went into practice and 
practice for hours saying, let's try this part three times here or twice there, or no, that bridge doesn't work. And it was all done in the context of the, somebody would often come in with an idea or a riff or something, but no. And then, and then I would say I wrote, uh, you know, the vast majority of the lyrics. Um, but that was a, that was a good band's band because we really did write collectively in DYS. Gave you that foundation going forward. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like, you know, in most bands you, you, and DYS is like this today. I'm sorry, down by law is like this today. Sam Williams, who's the, you know, my best friend and musical partner for many years now. And, and the, the guitar player for, for down by law, he's a, a stunning guitar player, just, just insane. But he's also emerged into a stunning songwriter. And so with Down By Law today, I just, I mean, I usually will write three to four songs on an album. I wrote all the vocal melodies and words for the most part. Sam usually does one one or two songs vocally. But um, but I tend to write you know, all my vocal melodies. But I get these songs from Sam. You know, he sends me digital clips or whatever. And he says, here, what do you think of this one? And I tell you... It is, Mike, it's like Christmas every day that he sends me something like that. It's just, it's like I hear these songs, I'm like, oh my God. And it's so great because it just, as soon as he knows me, obviously we've been partners for a long time. And and like when I hear it, the vocals pop, they pop right out. I mm -hmm. never have to struggle. It's instinctive for me when I hear Sam Williams songs, the melody, it's in my head like a, like a, you know, a tattoo, instant tattoo. It's crazy how that works. And, um, and then the lyrics flow, you know, just the same way. So it's it's a really cool thing. But that's how a lot of bands are. I don't know how you guys. That's wild. You know, do you guys did you guys kind of have like one force of nature as a songwriting? It was mostly or? me, mostly me. Um, I was just always the kid, sort of like in his room, just trying to write like twenty songs, and and I would just bring them stacks of songs, and and it started that way even before I was you know with MXPX. I, I, this MXPX is my first band, but. But um, I tried to start bands, and it just never quite worked, you know. And for sure. but I had yeah. all these songs. Um, but for me, you know, I'm just sitting in my room listening to like Dead Milkmen, and you know, all these just eclectic, yeah. random punk yeah. bands. Um, yeah. But 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 I just I, I love hearing hearing about you know what it took to like make certain records, and and just how you like ended up in Dag Nasty. So so you're now the roadie. And now they're roadie, and then I, I went over to what I thought was their practice. Uh, we used to they used to practice. We used to practice in um, Colin, our drummer's dad's basement um, in in Maryland, Southern Maryland, or not even Southern Maryland, but right outside of D.C. And um, so I went over there, and they're like, uh, "We've we've you know we pa we parted ways with our singer, and we need you to sing." And we had a tour coming up with the Descendants of all people in like you know just just a little bit of pressure right you know because yeah. they're such a great band <laughs> and in two weeks like it was coming up like it was like holy cow so um so they're like get downstairs we all bleached our hair um because that was like one of the dag nasty trademarks is you know everybody bleached their hair and um sang and you know like it was lucky because i'd been you know working for them in essence um you know so I knew every song, you know, pretty mm -hmm. well of, of the ones that were in that set list at that time. And then, of course, we I changed things around vocally, as you can hear on Can I Say. Um, I made it my own, and that's what you have to do. And mm -hmm. it, it has to be real, and it has to be fire, and it has to be spark. And and I think the the combination of that of those four people, you know, me, Brian, Colin, and Roger, on that album at that time for Can I Say was was a magic combination it really was and um um it just the, the the spark was like really insane and the, in the studio you felt it it was like palpable you could you could touch it it was such a really uh, exciting record to make it was exciting to make that record it wasn't like a labor like so many bands have you know take 12 take 15 mm -hmm. no, no no it wasn't it wasn't like that at all it was like something was in the air something was different Something was karmic. Something was, um, it, you know, it just, just, there was a spark there and it was, it was, you know, it was remarkable. Did you realize it at the time when you were there in the moment or are you just reflecting on that now? You're like realizing, wow. That no, was... no. I realized it. We realized it then. Everybody felt it. Yeah. It was weird. Wow. It was weird. Everybody felt it. That is rare. That's rare for sure. Yeah. It is rare. Yeah. So who normally, you know, you go in a yeah. studio and you're, 
I mean, you know this you know, better than most. Like you're, 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 you want to get the perfect take. You want to make not screw up. You want to, you know, make sure that the, you know, intro's right or whatever. And, you know, like th- there was almost none of that. I mean, it just was like this, this again, fire that just was lit and it was in the air and everybody knew it. Everybody felt it. Um, it was crazy. It was that crazy. is crazy. And that's your first yeah. recording session with, with, with Dagnasty. Dagnasty. With Dagnasty, yeah. 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 Wild. So you go on tour. So like it, it's anytime I hear about, you know, back in the day, um, <laughs> you know, I hear about, you know, any punk bands like Black Flag and, and everybody. It seems like such a small scene, a small world. Like people, everybody knows each other. Like, yeah, we kind of know Social Distortion. We know the Misfits sort of, but they don't talk to us. Like, was it like that? What was it like that, you know, with other bands? It was. So, so you know, when I was kind of talking about how we really didn't know what we were doing in DYS, that we were forming this whole thing, there weren't that many bands. And there weren't, it was still a, I mean, I, you know, had gotten into fights with people who, you know, would drive by and scream out, you know, um, horrible things and epithets and everything about punk rock. And, you know, and then I got, you know, jumped a few times. And I remember the FUs got in a big fight with a bunch of jocks coming out of a Red Sox game. We were in Kenmore Square. We all used to hang out, hang out with in Kenmore Square, the Boston crew guys. And um, baseball game, a guy now, a bunch of drunk guys were coming down and, and FUs were coming back from practice. And they got jumped by a big crowd of jocks with with those mini souvenir baseball bats. I don't think they sell them anymore. I hope not anyway, but they were like actual, <laughs> yeah. you could get a souvenir wooden baseball bat. It's like Taylor, it's like something out of the Warriors or something. It's like, you know, it, it was like a real, it was perfect if you wanted to do mischief with it. And um, so I still remember that. And I remember, you know, being in a, I was waiting for the shuttle bus um, at, at BC, Boston College. And, and I was waiting for the shuttle bus and I went into the little convenience store that was there and uh there was like sort of you know I was waiting i knew i had like another 10 minutes or something so i went in to get a you know water or coke or something and i and there was a big heavy set guy with his buddy and he said what's your act and then he used a couple of words that i won't repeat and um and i flippantly said what's your act you know and then like that was it you know and then boomity boomity boom you know uh, you know away it went and um you know that happened fairly often uh, because no one you know like i remember going to see ssd control one of their earliest show an early show at the rat in kenmore square in boston and there were like maybe eight ten of us kids there you know fans and um and they the the rat had it was downstairs where the shows were and and the they had tables pushed up. It was a bar, in essence, which had mm-hmm. shows. There was a little low, low, uh, lowish stage, not like a big, you know, stage like the Channel or something like that. But, you know, you know, relatively not very high off the ground stage, and then um, tables like for drinkers to, you know, sit down and enjoy seeing the concert. Well, of course, we started slamming, and of course, uh, tables got knocked over. And and all hell broke loose, man. It was just like bouncers, and these bouncers were massive and they were bored and they were all just looking to beat up the punks they did not like this built one bit and they so of course everything went haywire you know and and you know i remember i got pulled from behind and i you know foolishly i think it would have happened anyway but you know you get pulled from behind and the guy's grabbing my neck choking me Mm -hmm. this this bouncer and i could feel I, if you gave me a hundred dollar bill, I couldn't tell you what that guy looked like, except I could tell you what his arm looked like, because his arm muscle, his bicep, was choking me. He was choking me on purpose, and I looked down and saw this massive, massive bicep, you know, choking me. And he's, he, and then so of course, then I kind of, you know, I, I punched instinctively. I just punched it because I wanted to let him go because I was choking. Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't my best plan, you know. So he, he grabbed me and smashed my head twice into a pillar. I got thrown out the back of the club. Jamie, the bass player for SSD, Jamie Sharapa, who's you know a dear, dear good guy. Um, he he ju- he tried to take his bass off, and another bouncer grabbed him and threw him back. You know, threw him back on stage. You know, get the beep on stage. You know, yeah. And then, and I remember I was lying out on the on the in the back of the rat, bleeding, on on you know flat out on the you know on the dirt, gravel, broken beer bottles, everything. And this other guy got thrown out a second later. JT was his name. I don't actually know where where JT ended up, but 
Um, but he, he was, his eye was cut so badly and he was, I was lying like with my, on my right shoulder, I'd, I'd landed, you know, and looking sort of straight on the ground. He got, for whatever reason, fate or a movie director did it. I don't know, but like <laughs> he landed like facing me on his left side. So we're staring at each other, bleeding in the back of the rat. Um, and, and it was just like surreal, you know? And, uh, so we got up and Katie, the cleaning lady, uh, God love her. She came and took care of us, got us all cleaned up. And, you know, we did the whole stitches thing. And I remember we went back to her house, her apartment, and she had two rats named Sid and Darby, as in Sid Vicious and Darby mm-hmm. Crash. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I still remember Sid and Darby, her rats and, um, sitting there, you know, like just blood what dried blood all over me and yeah but katie took care of us which was great you know like punk so, rock so, is yeah, the life stuff, for me <laughs> right i know right and it's like that stuff happened all the time you know like i mean just being at the t stops and you know t is like the metro station in boston metro for boston there's above mm-hmm. ground and, and then it goes below ground and it's i think it's one of the oldest um transportation systems public transportation systems in america like chicago probably and a few others but anyway so you'd be at the outside t stops and people would drive by you know punk sucks meow you know you suck you know and then they'd start you know then you'd get other other names called and and stuff and you know i remember one time i i started laughing out loud i got some some bunch of bunch of guys drove by and yelled oh i was like what like i look nothing like diva i actually really like diva Diva. (laughs) but i wasn't wearing a yellow you know the yellow suit or a pot hat on my head you know a red flower on my head or any of the diva look i had none of that i was dressed in a leather jacket torn jeans combat boots you know spike bracelet like i had i had nothing to do with with diva looks wise i have no idea I guess that was the only connection to punk or new that's, wave that they had. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, I'm glad you got out of it. I mean, damn. A lot of I don't have any like bad experiences. I've gotten in a few fights, but mostly it was me seeing other people getting messed up. You know. Um, yeah. Well, it's good. I'm glad. It's not something I'm ever recommend. Um, you know, and every time I was involved, it was always somebody else had had, you know that initiated yeah uh, the, yeah you so see I'm, a friend punched in the pit or whatever you know those those happen too you know just all that teen angst and yeah aggression and a, probably like young adult assholes you know that are like not happy with their life working some job you know at a club and they're like these punkers come in here whatever it is right <laughs> so yeah um Easy. i want to hear more about how you went from Dag Nasty to all? So, yeah, great question. I ended up uh, leaving Dag Nasty to go to uh, to grad school, actually. And uh, I ended up um, actually living in, in Israel for a year. And um, while I was over in, in Jerusalem, um, I got a call from Bill Stevenson. And... Um, you know, if, if anybody doesn't know who Bill is, please uh, go listen to any Descendants or All Record to hear a phenomenal drummer and great guy. Anyway, um, but, uh, you know, so, or Black Flag, Black Flag, I mean, you know, Descendants, yeah. All, Black Flag, I mean, wow, you know, and that doesn't even count his many side projects and things like that. So he's he's a prolific and phenomenal musician. Um and again, a good, a really, really good dude. Um, but uh, anyway, um, Bill called me a couple of times and I remember he called me and this is before, you know, it was, it was, there was no internet yet. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is in 1987, something like that, 88, somewhere in there, seven. And then um, he called me and he said, um, you know, we're, Milo's going back to school. We're forming a new band. It's going to be called all oh, you're the singer. And I was like, Oh, um, Okay, you know, like, it was like it took me like three seconds to 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 say yes, and um, but we had many talks about how we wanted to do this after that, you know, and what we were going to do. And I I think the only contributing thing that I did, if if there is uh, any contribution that I made that was lasting, was I I said I really want to make all its own band, right? And I didn't want to have it just be Descendants Junior. 
Like I didn't want to do 10 Descendants songs and five all songs in a set or something like that. And I did that because I wanted us to be our own thing. And also because I knew that nobody could be Milo but Milo. And, um, you know, so so obviously, you know, you had the three guys who'd made the last two Descendants records, right? And um, so there was going to be some similarities in some of it. But I also knew that with me singing, it was going to sound different. And, um, and uh, you know, and it, it did. It did. Yeah. We, we formed our own sound and our own, um, uh, you know, well, we we are our own band right from the get go, and I was very glad that we did it that way, um, you know, and yeah. So it was it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and I I'd, I'd met Bill. I should have prefaced this. I, I met Bill when we did our dates with the Descendants, and I think I actually met him in Black Flag and DYS. So I knew him kind of like what you were saying before. Like we all kind of knew each other. Mm-hmm, I'd mm-hmm. met Bill when Black Flag played in Boston, and then I'd met him again when Dagnasty toured. Uh, with the descendants uh, in the early early days and then finally of course when when he called me and said you know he wanted me to sing for for all so how wild was it like so were you guys touring in just a van did you just figure out i'm sure there was no like record company money or anything like that like no tour budget so you just kind of like figuring it out right yeah that's pretty much it yeah it was in a van and um i'd never toured for so much um you know, at one time, mm-hmm. um, I think I, I charted it out and I think I was on the road, you know, for like 90 day, uh, 99 months out of the, um, out of the year. Mm. Um, so that's, that's a long time. Um, and that's really what I was burnt. I was just, I was just burnt. And I, that's when I left all was, it was never out of like, um, you know, anything negative. It was just, I was, I was tired. I just, you know, you never see your girlfriend, you know, um, you're, you're just beat. You're in a different city every night and all was a machine. We were machines. We played every night that we could. We did not, you know, we did it, you know, and it wasn't like, oh, well, you're going to get this guarantee tonight. And we'd say, no, that's not going to. No, no, we played. If it was a whatever the guarantee was, we would just take it and play. We wanted to play. We loved it. We loved it. And so we would play almost every night drive play drive play you know and it was great and i again kind of like what i was saying about dys i wouldn't change a single day um but um i was ready to, to i needed a break you know yeah some so yeah wow that's cool i mean yeah uh, nothing wrong with that um it's one of those things where you just live your life i, I was just listening to you guys and just never even thought about i wonder why dave left like <laughs> i mean it just you know yeah. but uh it just happens still still love the band we yeah. had a couple of small reunion things where all the singers did something and that was really fun mm-hmm. and um dy i'm sorry down by law has played a couple shows with with all or descendants and those have been great you know festivals and things yeah so we've we've had some great um interactions and um you know yeah it's just it's uh it's it, it is it is very interesting and challenging to have a band stay together you know for a long time with the same personnel it's just uh if you look at marriages uh, i think the rate is like roughly 50 percent you know of yeah. marriages don't last so that's just two people so uh you know imagine you know four artists and four to five artists in a band typically so i mean you got you got a lot of weird uh you know chemistry's you know meshing there and sometimes it meshes great um but but you know you look at um i mean even huge bands like metallica for instance you know obviously clip burton passing was a tragedy but they went through three bass players i think since then Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. you know and um and uh that's and two guitar players they so dave mustaine started in metallica and then then they you know they parted ways and got um you know, Kirk Hammett. And Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know what I mean? Like that's, so that's even at the macro level, at the highest level of success. Right. And members change. And, um, you know, being in a van and making, you know, $20 a day or whatever, that's, that's a different kettle of fish altogether, you know? So it's, it's a tough life, especially in the early days. That's a test for sure. People that have gone through that, I have the utmost respect for because yeah, it is, you know, these days people quit so easy. And back in the day, like there was like a few people, a few bands that I would kind of like that I knew that just kind of quit or whatever. But for the most part, if you were out there on the road, 
you were sort of part of that breed of of people of bands that were just all right we're doing this and i learned from watching all i learned from watching the descendants and, and those were sort of like the who i was closest to in mind as far as like my musical influences nice thank you um, that's great to hear yeah just like their work ethic I, I i tried to take all of that um and apply it to what we were doing i could ask a million awesome. questions about all and i won't yeah, so no, that's okay though but i will tell you this that this will make your you, you mentioned all and you mentioned work ethic and your own work ethic and i'm so glad you said that because you know one of the things about all i didn't kind of when i was talking about all those conversations that i had with bill when i was living in jerusalem and, and he was in la um by the way, I think he said his bill was like two thousand dollars. His phone bills. So isn't that crazy <laughs> to think about that? You know, it's like yeah. an insane, insane amount of times that we talked for hours and formulated our really built our friendship and our musical vision for all. But but anyway, um, his his vision. Bill is the author of the idea of go for all, right? Mm-hmm. And and that means, and if you read the you know liner notes in in one of the early all records, you know. Um, one of his buddies from from high school uh, died um, fishing. He mm-hmm. overloaded his boat, and and the boat sank. And that to Bill was like, you know, horrible. Of course, to lose a close friend, but also, in a way, that friend was going for all. You know, yeah. you know, and and just don't, you know, there's there is no sum. There S O M E. There's only all A L L. You know, go for all. You know, reach for that reach for that brass ring on the on the carousel you know and uh so that's beth's billy in a nutshell and he clearly inspired a lot of people nice yeah no absolutely there was no sum until summary right exactly (laughs) yeah yeah. descendants though but um yeah yeah, same family like i said i could go on and on but let's bring it back to don't sleep to the new album sea change and kind of end it there because i wanted people to hear just like a little tiny clip of the first song you guys released and um it's called promise made like you said you heard it on the radio Uh, i've been doing this lately on the podcast just like little clips so people can just they don't have to even go find it they can just hear what it what it's going to be a little bit um and then we talk about it that vibe right there that's like that's classic to me and hearing that gets me just pumped ready for the record awesome. um that's the first single it's not the first song necessarily on the record though is it because the full record's not out yet like i said it's coming out friday uh it is not the first song on the record no um i actually don't know if this is sequenced right i am not sure if i shouldn't guess because is Dead on the Inside the first song? I'm not sure. Mm, I'm looking through. Let's listen to that real quick. Dead on the Inside is another one. You guys have a video out that you just put out recently. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Skate video. Really fun. Uh, I loved this song, too. It was another one that you're like, dude, this could have been just just on any record back in the day. One of your records. But Oh, shoot. Sorry, there's an ad on the video. <laughs> you know how that goes. Hey, people have to pay the bills, right? Yes, they do. So, uh, Don't Sleep, Dead on the Inside, official video's out. It's on End Hits Records. Here we go. Yeah. Dude, loving it. Loving it. That's exactly you know what I what I you know when I'm hearing like mo- why is modern hardcore so big right now? Like you're seeing it everywhere and this kind of fits right into the mix with everybody. It's like here we are. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's really cool. And I got to say, the End Hits Records guys, um, OIC, the owner, and, and, and all the rest of the pe- folks that he's working you know, with him um, are phenomenal. And they really believe it. They love it. And, and I think this album, you know, how I was telling you when I first heard it all put together, how much I was just like, holy cow, you know, yeah. it's like, whoa, you know, and and um, and that, that sounds I got to be careful. I'm not trying to be vain. I'm talking about the guys who actually did the hard work of making it all put together. Right. Like not the not me or anything like that. I was like, damn, this thing smokes, you know, and it's like it was it was really good the way they did it, you know, and um, and and then, you know, again, I was a lot of credit for that goes to Garrett and Tony. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's the records fire. I'm really happy with it. And that promise made, I think is like maybe touches closest to what we're talking about here. You and I now, which is, you know, we believe in the promise made, keep in mind the promise made, nothing is ever really safe. So hold true to the promise made. Do you remember excitement? Do you remember the thrill? We would go any distance. We would charge any hill and it shaped me and it shaped you. So here we are. What are we going to do? You know, like it's it's all about, you know, hardcore was always more than just music to those of us who did it. And um, we believed in its ability to first and foremost change ourselves. Right. And to to, because to me, it was always an individualistic type of growth. Right. It was all about like challenging yourself. What, Mm. you know, break musical barriers. I was a musician. You know, I was always a musician first before I was even anything else. I grew up singing and choirs and church and you know and and then made musicals in high school and stuff like that so so i i I really grew up as a singer and played piano lessons and all these kinds of things so like i was a musician and then became a punk rock guy in high school but so to me the boundaries were always personal like and 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 challenge and hardcore was so great at that because it formed a community Mm -hmm. of guys that were also challenging themselves and and then the idea, of course, is that if you change yourself, you can make a dent for the positive in the world, right? You can make the world a little bit better. So Promise Made, is, is that's what that's about. Like, you know, rekindling that spark, that memory of when the world was, yes, challenging sometimes, like in those early days that I described. But also what I didn't describe in all those scenes are all the great moments, mm-hmm. forming our own scene, the brotherhood that existed within the Boston crew. Um, shows that we put together from the ground up, carrying the, the, the speakers for the PA up multiple flights of stairs and and the spark that came out of that. You know, um, those are the things I didn't really talk about. But but there was such a joy in in hardcore and there should be a joy in hardcore and a fraternity. And, a, and, a, and I mean that including everybody, you know, all genders. And so, like, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was just like it was a a, a real um team effort you know and 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 at the same time as we were growing and challenging ourselves we knew that we had a a, a group of people that were our family you know yeah people that were coming to those shows and so that's what promise made is all about and we're going to try and don't sleep is making you know make keeping the promise i hope I, yeah. I believe we are well said i you know i needed to hear that i think a lot of people need to hear that need to know that we're still out there, you know, people like you are still out there and making good music and it's all happening right now in 2023 and beyond. So thanks for taking the time. I, I you know, I can't wait to, to see the rest of the, you know, hear the rest of the songs and, uh, um, yeah, brother, I'll man. make sure you get the full, the full thing. I, I don't know if you want a digital or vinyl or, or CD, but whatever you want, we got it. We got it covered for you. So just let me know. Right on uh, work. work by thank the way, you. I, I I should tell um, the, your listeners this as well, that the vinyl and the CD are both cool in this one because um, there there's, of course, regular vinyl, and that's awesome. And there is a gold variant vinyl limited to 125 copies, which is not very many. Um, and that's going to be on Cortex, um, uh, you know, in, in Germany and then in Europe. And then um, there is a Rev uh revelation you know distribution mm. has its own colored vinyl so um there's there's a couple of really cool limited edition um colored variants and i know a lot of people uh, think that love that stuff and i do too i think it's just really neat definitely now what oisey and end hits record did for this one on the cd side is really cool also 
So normally, you know, you get the CD and it's in that clear plastic jewel case and, you know, and you open it and it's a pain to open because the wrapper's too tight, all that stuff. Right? Yeah. But, but like in this case, the CD comes with all of or most of the early singles that we made that are long out of print. These are before we were recorded, Turn the Tide, you know, they're all out of print and they're hard to get. And so he got the, he put them all together. So when you get the CD, you get um, the full the full album, of course, you know, sea change, but then you also get all these other things and there's some cool graphics that come with it. Oh, that's so cool. It's super. Yeah. Is that on a yeah. separate disc? Is it like two discs, like your album and then the, the singles or is it actual singles? That's a great question. I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. I just know that he told me about it. And I thought it was pretty badass, but I no don't matter really what it's know. Cool. cool. <laughs> yeah. And I, there's like a little poster. Oh, and one other thing I should, I should tell you, um, uh, we, uh, if you when you get i think it's on well it'll probably be on the cd as well i'm guessing because so we asked chris sherry who's a phenomenal artist mm-hmm. speaking of all on descendants um uh, chris sherry is just you know an insanely talented artist and a great dude as well and he uh he did a really great um artwork for this album so basically if you ever bought the beatles uh red or blue album you know the beatles uh you know had these two albums Mm-hmm. And if you open them up, especially on the blue album, I think was where I remember the idea came from for me. But uh, you open it up, and it's a double album, first of all. So you, it was a gate, you know, gatefold sleeve or whatever. And you saw a picture of a crowd at Buckingham Palace, right? And just tourists and kids and grandmas and everything looking in to watch the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. But interspersed in that crowd, in that famous picture, are the Beatles, so Paul McCartney's, you know, like I mm-hmm. think he's crouched down, you know, next to a little kid and George Harrison is, you know, just mixed in with the crowd and so forth. So it's really cool. And so Chris recreated, Chris Sherry recreated that and put uh, members of Don't Sleep into the crowd. And I thought that was really, really cool. And it's a it's like kind of a unique collector's ish item, I would say, uh, just for the artwork alone. Hopefully the songs will, you know make it worth everything too but you know yeah the um the artwork is great that he did for it that's awesome on the lyric sheet yeah yeah super stoked about that you got to have good artwork i mean you do these and days lyrics. yes of and course lyrics, lyrics. <laughs> yeah. all right where can people find it uh is it don't do you have a website for don't sleep or is it the record label um i think through the record label through end hits and probably through rev hq and uh cortex you know for in europe and like it's it's available you know pr- should be pretty pretty readily available i would definitely get in pre-orders now though especially if you want to get um or if this is coming out as the the week of you know yeah get those vinyl copies if you want them because they they're not very many and it's super cool so uh, i think i think if i were getting it if i you know weren't in the band i would probably order one of the colored vinyl variants just because it's so cool so yeah I'm a, I'm a nerd you know so <laughs> we love it awesome yeah man well thank you so much for your time i appreciate it dave um it's been a pleasure hey, thanks thanks for having me right back at you brother really a pleasure thanks so much and uh, i love what you're doing here that's that's really phenomenal and you know i talked earlier about you know everybody you know takes a village for for everything to succeed in all this crazy art world that we do and by all means dialogue conversations like this bringing the joy of, of music to people um, in various forms. It's also critical. And, and thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. I love it. It's inspiring. And I learned a lot today. So <laughs> thanks. All right. Peace, everybody. Yeah. Dave Smalley, go get the new record. Don't sleep. Sea change. Sea change.